uh, drive her own instruction in her classroom. And then Albert Watt from the National Governors Association will wrap things up for us, really trying to tie together this theme of standards, policies, and implementation. So it was that um, I we uh, we are ready to launch into our presenters, um, and so we will start with Sue Pimentel. And it seems like we might be having some technological issues with our slides, so we will we're frantically working on it. Okay, we're good to go now. So. Um, we're going to start with Sue Pimentel, who was one of the lead writers um, of the Common Core State Standards for uh, English Language Arts and Literacy. So Sue, please go ahead. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. So my job today is to give you an overview of the Common Core State Standards, something about the development process and about the involvement of um, early childhood experts in it and um, what some of the big shifts are um, as, as we think about uh, K-3 standards. Can you do the next slide? Or do you just want me to go? Go ahead. Just do, do, can you do the next slide? Oh, here we go. OK. So the whole notion about developing common core uh, standards, what was this about, um, uh, really is sort of near and dear to my heart, because I've been working in the standards um, arena for quite a while. And um, the first is really preparing students um, making sure that they really have what they need to succeed in their post-secondary endeavors as opposed to feeling like students follow all the rules, take all the tests, do everything they're supposed to do, and then they end up in remedial courses in college um, and, and, and don't finish. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we're, you know, we have a global economy now and making sure that our students are globally competitive, so what is it that they need in order to prepare? Um, and the next one really is about equity, and it's one of the reasons I work in the standards arena to really, um, I really see it as um, sort of civil rights of students um, to learn the good stuff and that um, expectations are high for all students um, and it's not dependent upon where a student lives um, or what means they have. And then certainly the last one, which maybe we'll hear some of our presenters talk about today, about the ability now to collaborate across state lines that we aren't just um, you know, it isn't, you know, Michigan versus Massachusetts, and they can't really talk because they're dealing with different standards. And so this is the sort of, was sort of the impetus behind the states deciding they wanted to get together and see if we couldn't create a set. Next slide. So just to give you just a little background on the process and timeline, um, while I was um, uh, led a small uh, writing team, um, we also then had were supported by external work groups um, that included researchers, teachers, and other experts, some of them giving us almost daily advice as we moved through the process. Um, uh, the first uh, job we did was really to look at uh, what students needed to be college and career ready. So we started really at, at that bar, meaning that where, where students graduate from high school, what is it that they need um, uh, to, to have under their belt. And then from there, we, we um, worked with the K-12 um, K standards, so we worked grade specific standards. No, we didn't do pre-K. Um, we, the standards went through many rounds of, um, of review from the states, but then we also got public comment in, on March 10th, and there were close to 10,000 comments that we got from around the nation. So parents wrote in, um, teachers wrote in, um, uh, you know, from around the country, folks that were interested. Finally, um, the standards were released. We began the process in, in 2009. Finally, by June 2010, uh, they were released, and then. Um, to date, 46 states have adopted the Common Core State Standards. Um, and, and some others are, are the, a couple of holdouts there are, are thinking maybe they'll, they'll, they'll watch to see how the assessments come forward, whether or not they join or not. So um, the early childhood experts were, um, uh, were very vocal as we went through. And I wanted to just show you the kinds of things that they told us, um, which were really interesting. Um, I happen to be an early childhood educator in one of my, uh, one of my um, a past lives in my training. So um, it was interesting to hear. Um, we had kept media and technology um, for older students. And we had kept um, the notion of research. 
um, starting like in grade four, and we heard very forcefully from early childhood educators to make sure that um, students are dealing with media and technology um, as early as kindergarten, and really, really doing what they called shared research. Um, obviously, we wouldn't ask the student to go off and do research on their own, but a shared research and class project was important to get started even in the earliest grades. They asked us to uh, really strengthen the global and cultural diversity of the readings. We had, um, there aren't mandated readings, but we were showing the types of readings um, uh, uh, sort of based on complexity um, in Appendix B, and they wanted to make sure that we really strengthen the cultural diversity of those, um, of, of, of the texts that were selected there. Um, you'll notice, too, if you looked at the Common Core, that um, we added in wording um, uh, in, in several places uh, that says, with prompting and support, students, blah, blah, blah. With prompting and support, you know, they ask questions and so on, ask, ask and answer questions. But there was a sense that it was important to understand that students are just, just beginning their, um, their school careers, and this wasn't meant to be, um, uh, uh, you know, you know this, this, this sort of cold mandate, um, but to do it in a, in a shared way. Um, the next point you'll see in the introduction, but not in the standards themselves, um, some early childhood um, experts were concerned that the standards would sort of beat um, play, if you will, out of um, uh, for students to be able to learn through play, um, which I know through my own training is so important. And so we have a statement in there that really speaks to the standards, talk about what students should be having practice with, what they should be learning, but not how. Um, and that really um, is up to teachers in terms of how. Um, and the last part um, is to make sure that while these were standards to prepare students for um, as they move up the grades to, to make sure that they're on a trajectory to be well prepared for whatever post-secondary desires they have, um, that, that having ELA literacy standards isn't the be-all and end-all, meaning it's, it, it's a necessary part of what students have, but it certainly isn't sufficient. And this hopefully gets to the notion of, of the whole child, of the social part, the emotional part, the other, other um, academic um, pursuits that students need to have. So we, we wrote that into the introduction as well, based on what we heard from the early um, childhood experts. Next slide. So the key shift. Um, uh, one is to make sure that um, uh, the, the Common Core has a, um, that, that when students now have a balance of text, so that it's, it, yes, there's literature, which is so important and rich for students to have um, uh, throughout their school careers, but certainly in elementary school, but also to have an equal measure of informational text. Um, I know from my own granddaughter that she's all into geckos these days and wanting to read books on geckos and um, that, that students are hungry for information about the world. And we also know that informational texts are harder for students um, uh, to grapple with because of the, the variety of text structures and the vocabulary and the like. And it's so important for them to have an equal mix. So it, the, the Common Core um, uh, asks for a, a, real, a real shift there. Um, it also asks students to have regular opportunities to encounter complex texts. Now, obviously, students are only beginning to learn how to read, um, um, but there is a, 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 a real push there for making sure that students have opportunities um, to listen to and be part of read aloud, where they can hear the language, the vocabulary, and the syntax of texts that they're not able to read maybe uh, themselves uh, for, for a couple of years. So, so again, the, the notion of complexity of text already begins to show, show itself um, in the earlier grades. Um, writing opportunities, um, this was interesting for, um, for students, are, are prominent and varied even in the earliest grades. Um, in, some case, in some cases, it's that a student might dictate their words to the teacher. Um, they might, might show pictures um, uh, and the like. Um, uh, but, but that they really do begin to write and express themselves through writing, um, um, even in the earliest level. And um, the last shift um, is to make sure that students have, have opportunities to really collaborate with one another in small groups and in partners, um, it, it, to cultivate their understanding, um, their respect for one another, being able to work with others, responsibility um, for coming to a, a group prepared, as well as their um, as well as their independence. And so, those are the ma major and key shifts in the in the Common Core um, as 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 I look at it. And I think that's it for me. Fantastic! Thanks very much, Sue. Um, I should note that we will also be having uh, each presenter's contact information listed, so if you have follow-up questions, you can contact them directly. And as always, um, the presentations will be available 
online at the Pre-K through Third National Work Group website uh, in about a week. Right now we have a first poll up to get a little bit of feedback on how you all as attendees are viewing Common Core. Whether or not you see them as a force for good that's actually going to increase the quality of education. If you think they're probably not going to change very much in terms of the learning opportunities that young children are receiving or if you have a fear that the Common Core may actually increase inappropriate educational experiences for young uh, children, or if you just really haven't thought about it very much and you don't have an opinion. Um, we know that there's lots of discrepant perspectives on, um, on Common Core and the influence they're going to have. So this is just, uh, again, to take the temperature of how you all are viewing Common Core. So we'll leave a few more seconds for you to reply, and then I will be able to show you the responses. And as we're doing that, Jean will start queuing up um, you for your presentation. And Jean is going to be focusing on alignment and um, what something that I believe the Common Core is really pushing is the need to align Common Core with state existing early learning standards and with the Head Start standards. And so Jean will be presenting work that she's been doing with Dr. Sharon Lynn Kagan and Dr. Catherine Scott Little around alignment analyses. So here are the results of how people are viewing Common Core of the 200 and some folks we have listening in right now. And Jean, we're ready for you to go. OK. Thank you, Christy. I'm really happy to be here. I'm sorry my colleague Sharon Lynn Kagan could not be here for technological and scheduling reasons, but I know she wanted to be and very much wants to voice her strong support for this effort, as does my colleague Catherine Scott Little at uh, the University of North Carolina, who's also part of our team, our research team on alignment analyses. So I'm going to talk today about alignment analyses, uh, why we think alignment is important and what it accomplishes, a little bit about our own work on analyzing an alignment in between documents and how we do that, and then finally what I think the implications are for policy and practice. Uh, so first, why align standard documents? Well, uh, it's, it's probably pretty clear to most of the people here today, early learning standards are a critical component of early care and education systems that support high quality programs for young children. But program administrators and teachers are currently juggling multiple standards documents of varying quality or documents that have somewhat different emphases. Uh, states in that context uh, need to create consistency and cohesion among these documents while assuring their quality. Next slide, please. Christy? Oh, there we go. Thank you. So what is it that we think alignment will accomplish? Aligning standards can create consistent, cohesive, and quality standards that we believe cover a breadth of domains and areas of early learning that are appropriate to children's ages, that encourage an intentional approach to the care and teaching of young children, that articulate expectations for children's learning trajectories that in turn support instructional continuity, that offer a starting point for curriculum and assessment choices that are consistent with what we want children to learn, that can guide professional development efforts to improve teaching and learning. And finally, that support high quality programs across multiple settings and programs that are under different auspices. Next slide, please. So how do we, uh, this uh, TCUNC research team, analyze alignment? Well, first of all, when we examine alignment, this is really our uh, probably our, our biggest priority, is that we look for both match and quality. So this requires more than a crosswalk analysis that looks for one-to-one -one correspondence among paired indicators in two documents. Match documents, we believe, are not necessarily quality documents. So we suggest that high complexity alignment analyses are important because they consider multiple dimensions of alignment that can in turn reflect both match and quality. Next slide, please. So how do we do it? 
Well, we, as I said, there are multiple dimensions in this kind of analysis, and I'm going to talk just about a couple of them. One of them is what we call balance. The balance analysis examines how indicators, we look at the uh, indicator level of standards documents. So the balance analysis examines how those indicators are distributed among five domains of early learning and development. And the results indicate the relative emphasis that states devote to each of the five domains of learning and development. So it can tell them if they uh, are articulating priorities such as social emotional development or cognitive, the cognitive domain or language and literacy. Uh, or physical development or approaches to learning, uh, which of those domains are getting the most indicators and thereby articulating a priority for those domains, or how well are the indicators balanced across them. And then states can see if the balance of their indicators across the five domains is consistent with the balance in another document, such as the Head Start framework or the Common Core. And also, changes in the balance across age groups, so from comparing younger to older age groups, standards for different age groups, can reflect how states are making the transition from a developmental orientation that's appropriate for early childhood to a more academic orientation that becomes more appropriate at older ages. A second dimension of alignment that we look at is something we call coverage and depth. The coverage and depth analysis examines how indicators are distributed among particular aspects of learning and development within each of those five domains. So the results indicate what states are covering in their standards and in one depth, in what depth they are doing so. States can then see if their coverage and their emphasis of a particular aspect of early learning is consistent with the coverage and emphasis found in another document, such as the Head Start framework or the common core. So in the approaches to learning domain, for example, we have uh, particular areas of learning that we call constructs, such as uh, initiative or willingness to try or persistence uh, in the face of frustration. And they can see, states can see how much their own standards emphasize those aspects of learning and development, and then compare them to other documents, such as the Head Start framework or the common core, and see if the emphasis is similar or the same. And then finally, again, looking at these kinds of analyses over time, the coverage and depth analysis over age groups, states uh, can see if their expectations for the trajectory of children's learning is consistent with what they want children to learn. And then they can also compare that with other documents. Next slide, please. So, what are the implications for policy and practice of doing this kind of analysis and thinking about standards in this way? Well, first of all, standards that are not aligned are clearly confusing to program administrators and teachers and hinder efforts to support quality programs as a result. But we think that standards that are aligned with other important documents help build an infrastructure of quality for quality programs that is consistent, cohesive, and makes sense to administrators and teachers. So with that goal, we believe alignment analyses should consider both match and quality to build a foundation for quality programs. And finally, that high complexity analyses are needed to allow states to consider both match and quality. And that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, obviously, uh, alignment is a complex endeavor that um, takes a lot of intentionality. Uh, and um, ex extended work. And so this next poll is going to ask you to what extent you think the standards that you're using are well aligned from pre-K through third grade or from birth through third grade. Again, just reflect on the standards documents that are most relevant to your work. Maybe it's just pre-K through third grade. Maybe it's birth um, through third grade. Maybe it's infants and toddlers aligning with pre-K standards. But just to get a sense of um, the depth and meaningfulness of the alignment that you think um, your standards currently have, uh, I can say anecdotally from uh, my travels around the country that a lot of people do the dot-to-dot -dot alignment that Jean mentioned and haven't really focused on the constructs of balance and coverage and depth. So um, we're appreciative of Jean's and Lynn Kagan's and Catherine Scott Little's work in this area. 
So um, we are going to close the poll now, and I will show you um, how many of you think your uh, standards are aligned, and it's apparent that the majority of you believe your standards are somewhat aligned. Um, and a full 7% think your standards are not aligned at all. So obviously in this uh, climate where there are so many different standards documents, um, greater attention to alignment is uh, necessary. Our next two speakers, Sophia Pappas and Jen Rosenbaum, are with the Office of Early Childhood Education at the New York City Department of uh, Education. And they um, will share how they have both aligned their standards and, more importantly, how they are linking those to a district-wide professional development approach. So Sophia and Jen, welcome. Great. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining today. Um, I think we'll just wait for the slides to come up in a second. Um, I'm going to focus on giving you some context for the work. Um, as Christy said, at the local level in New York City, we've really been focusing on implementing the Common Core standards in a way that's aligned with K-12. Um, and so before I get into the professional development end of it, in terms of how we've been supporting teachers and all of this, I think it's it's important to give some context because there are, in certain ways, what we're doing builds on what we've heard from previous speakers. There are also ways that um, what's going on in New York is different from what's going on in a lot of other states because of the way that New York State has approached um, Common Core in the early grades. Next slide, please. OK. So in terms of context, um, it's important to note where our implementation of the Common Core fits in the bigger DOE's goal. So Sue talked about how when the Common Core standards in general are really designed to lay out expectations that are going to ensure that kids are college and career ready by the time they leave our schools. So at, in, in New York, we really see early childhood as the first step in that process. And so when we think about that in terms of the standards, the standards are really important for the instructional vision of New York City schools as a whole. Because basically what we're saying is, from the time kids are entering our, our doors in pre-K, we're going to have aligned expectations that if you take them from pre-K all the way up through elementary, middle, and high school, by the time kids do leave high school, they will have the skills and the knowledge um, that they need to really have, you know, to really be college and career ready. Um, so what we have in the slide, you'll notice that there are four priorities, starting with raise expectations for teaching and learning. We put these here. These are actually DOE-wide priorities for pre-K to 12. And we're going to be focusing on the first priority today of raise expectations for teaching and learning, because that really gets to the heart of the standards piece of how, you know, New York City is raising expectations for what students are learning and then how they're learning on the instructional end of things, really by using the Common Core as the orienting framework for, for both pieces of that. And so what Jen and I are going to be focusing on is, at the pre-K level, what all of that implementation looks like. And it's important to note that when we talk about pre-K and we talk about kids entering our doors in pre-K, we're talking about kids who are in public schools and in community-based settings. And in New York City, we have 58,000 kids who are in pre-K the year before kindergarten. And two-thirds of those kids are in community-based organizations, and the rest of them are in public school. So when we talk about implementing the Common Core in pre-K, um, we are saying whether you're in a public school, when it, whether you're in a community-based setting, whether that community-based setting has, also has Head Start or doesn't have Head Start, all kids in New York City, by the time they get to kindergarten, will have exposure to the Common Core. So what do we mean by the Common Core? Because Sue, as Sue said, the Common Core standards nationally actually are K to 12. So this is why it's important to understand the New York context. In New York State, New York State made a decision to develop Common Core for pre-K. And so this was, these standards are really designed to be a bridge between early childhood and K-12. Um, but it's important to note that the New York State Common Core Pre-K standards, which are known as New York State Pre-K Foundation for the Common Core, have two pieces. One piece, which is connected to K-12 directly, is on the literacy and math side. So these are basically the Common Core standards that we'll see in K-12 
but at the pre-K level, so that you can really say that you have the alignment of math and literacy standards from pre-K all the way through the 12th grade. But we know that there also needs to be a focus on other domains of development. So the pre-K foundations for the Common Core, in addition to having those math and literacy standards that are aligned to K-12 Common Core, also have standards in the other domains, so approaches to learning, physical development, social, emotional, and so forth. And by doing all of that, by having both those other domains and the math and literacy aligned with K-12, you know, we, we have this framework for standards that ensures that we are focusing on the whole child. We are ensuring that kids are getting a solid foundation in all respects in pre-K. And But we're also ensuring that the instruction that comes after pre-K is going to build on what happened in pre-K in a way that is aligned. Next slide, please. And so that was on the New York State um, side of things. In New York City, we really saw the introduction of Common Core and Pre-K as, as an incredible opportunity. And you know, I, I'm a former Pre-K teacher myself, and I experienced firsthand how frustrating it can be to not have that connection with K-12. But I also know, as being a former Pre-K teacher, that anytime we talk about building a P-12 system and integrating ourselves with P-12, we want to do it in a, in a developmentally appropriate way. So Jen and I and our team in New York City really took this as our charge to say, OK, how do we really take advantage of this opportunity to have aligned expectations for, for teaching and learning, while at the same time not making this a push down, really building that foundation that I talked about for the whole child and connecting with the K-12 world. Um, so what I have here is a quote from um, Shale Saransky, who is the Chief Academic Officer from the New York City Department of Ed. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the, the point here is to say that Shale, in this quote, is really capturing the essence of what we're saying with implementing Common Core and Pre-K, where Pre-K is the first step towards getting kids to be college and career ready. And any time we talk about college and career readiness, we talk about those efforts starting when kids enter our doors, whether that door is a public school door or a door to a community-based organization where most of our kids actually um, attend pre-K. And the other important thing to note about this context is DOE leadership as a whole has embraced this. So we have the chancellor speaking about P-12, talking about the Common Core in pre-K, increasingly taking more and more of an interest in what's going on in the early grades. Um, and then we have you know, folks like Shal and his and his own and his other colleagues um, really um, looking at how in pre-K especially and in the early grades you have the combination of what's going on with math and literacy for the common core but also the social emotional development that is so important for thinking about kids really having the approaches to learning that are necessary um, to be on that path towards college and career readiness. So that's the context for what's going on in New York City. I'm going to hand it over to Jen because we all know that any policy is only is also requires really strong implementation and support for the teachers who are working with children every day um, in classrooms. And so Jen's going to talk about how we approach the development of teachers um, in order to really implement Common Core in pre-K in a way that is going to give us that connection with K-12, but is also going to be developmentally appropriate. Great. Thanks, Sophia. So I'm going to dive in a little bit more about the professional development and other supports that we've provided to teachers. And just as Sophia provided some context on the New York City approach, I think it's important to couch this also in the way that we're approaching the rollout of the Common Core in pre-K to 12 in the city. So we're on a multi-year rollout plan. Our standards will be fully implemented by the 2014-15 school year. And so as part of that plan, last year, Shale and his team and the chancellor issued a set of citywide instructional expectations. And those held true for students in pre-K to 12. And the foundation of those expectations is this diagram that you see here. So the focus is really on looking at student work, helping students engage in common core aligned units and tasks, which I'll talk more about, analyzing the work from those units, designing future units in this cyclical process. And just like Sophia mentioned, we do want to make sure that this is happening in a developmentally appropriate way for four-year-olds. When we say student work, 
we mean everything from drawings, photos, anecdotal notes, etc. And when we talk about units, we're talking about interdisciplinary thematic units uh, that are taking place across the day in centers and read alouds, all of those good early childhood practices. And when we talk about common core aligned tasks, we're talking about intentional small group learning experiences that kids are engaging in with their teachers. So the way that we've taken this underpinning of the instructional expectations and really made it come alive for our teachers is this diagram that you see here on the slide. So we've called this our data reflection cycle. And this has been the underpinning of all of the professional development that we've done for our teachers this year. So our office provides four PD days, professional development days, for teachers across the city in the CBOs and in the public schools. And we've used this year to get them well-versed in looking at student work and analyzing it against the Common Core standard. So our first session of the year, we got teachers really familiar with this assessment component. And we wanted to help them understand all of the different ways that they could collect evidence of student learning in relation to their standards. So we talked about the best practices for anecdotal notes, for collecting videos, pictures, all of those rich sources of information. After that, we really focused on the assessment and evaluation. So now that you have that, what can you do with that work? How do you determine if it's aligned with the standards? How do you determine where students' strengths and areas for growth are, if it's a couple of students or if it's across your class? And then the, the last two sessions of the year, we focused in on these curriculum and pedagogy pieces. Now that teachers were well-versed in analyzing the work, what will they do with it? How will they design their curriculum in a way that meets the needs of all the students in their class? And how will they execute that and make sure that they're taking advantage not only of that planned curriculum, but also of all of those teachable moments that we know arise in early childhood classrooms? And I think this was a helpful way to ground the PD around the Common Core, the Pre-K Foundation for the Common Core because it kept everything grounded in the student work. And if teachers are really going to understand what it looks like to implement these new standards, they need to understand what it looks like in their classroom with their kids and with their colleagues. And so this was a helpful framework for them to use. And keeping this consistent type of framework throughout the year really helped deepen the level of teachers' conversations. So going to see teachers in October starting to engage with this versus in March in their last session of the year, the level of their conversations and the extent to which they were able to accurately analyze their work dramatically increased. As a part of the curriculum and pedagogy, we also designed these sample common core aligned units. So if we can go to the next slide. So these are, again, part of New York City's multi-year rollout strategy. So we had sample units available for students pre-K to 12. Um, and the idea behind these units is, again, to help teachers start to understand what common core aligned instruction looks like. All of the units have sample annotated student work so that teachers can see what it looks like for children to engage in this type of work and um, be meeting the standards. So we took this in pre-K and did the same thing. So we developed these common core aligned units, which are based on common early childhood themes. So we'll see in a second, we have themes about planting, about trucks, about five senses. And we've infused the common core standards, the pre-K foundation for the common core, with all of the domains of development into there. Um, and so we use these as samples within our professional development, help teachers understand the components of the units, what might be different from what they've done in the past, what's similar to what they've done in the past, and where they can build on their current practice. So if we go to the next slide, we see an example of two girls working with their teacher on one of these common core aligned tasks. So this classroom has been engaging in the trucks unit. And the teacher is working with these two children on a trucks task. So basically what the children are doing is they're understanding or they're practicing the concept of addition and subtraction. You see the trucks driving along the road. They're talking about how many trucks there are now. One pulled off to get some gas. How many trucks are left on the road? 
And the teacher you can see right next to her has a piece of paper where she's jotting down anecdotal notes about what the children are doing, what they're saying, and their understandings in relation to the standard. On the next slide, you'll see a work sample from a child who is responding to an informational fact. Um, she, the class is engaging in a unit about my five senses. And so they read a book about the five senses. And this child, Jaleesa, has drawn a picture illustrating several of the senses. And so as Sue mentioned earlier, the focus on drawing, writing, and dictating is huge in the Common Core, and the same in our pre-K foundation for the Common Core. So we really focused our units on helping teachers understand how to infuse these informational texts into their classroom in meaningful ways for the students. So if you go to the next slide, there's just a list of websites and resources that you can go to. Um, so you can see our pre-K units. You can also see the units from um, pre-K to 12, so that you can feel free to um, go there, use the units if they're helpful to you, and we're also happy to answer questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Sophia and Jen. Um, obviously, the City of New York has um, really extended from the work that uh, the state did uh, in uh, not only linking pre-K to the Common Core, but then ensuring teachers are well equipped. We're going to do two polling questions right now. One of them um, we missed during the early technological glitches. Um, this is just so we can get a sense of who is actually listening in. Uh, and so we're trying to get a general sense of how many of you are um, either teachers or administrators in pre-K programs. Um, so this could be uh, uh, state-funded pre-K, child care, Head Start. How many of you are elementary school teachers or administrators, so working in a K3, K5, K6 environment? How many of you are central office folks working at a school district or some other community-wide, community-level entity, which could include resource and referrals and other um, municipal-level entities? How many of you are actually engaged in state-level work um, in a policy office or in a statewide uh, advocacy organization? And then obviously the catch-all other category. This will just give us a sense for who is uh, actually on the phone. And then, um, so we're almost done polling there. So we can see that we have um, quite a few state-level folks, 10% um, in the pre-K realm, and then 12% in that elementary school and school district role. And then obviously the researcher in me really wants to know who that other 41% is, but <laughs> unfortunately our uh, polling results don't uh, allow us to give more than five options. So based on that um, poll, I'm going to launch the next one, which is thinking about the kinds of professional development you have received. Because I do believe that these kinds of professional development are important, uh, no matter if you're working in a classroom or at a state policy role. Um, have you received professional development that has helped you to do the following things? Understand the relationship among standards, curriculum, and assessment. Understand how to use standards to improve instruction. Understand, as uh, Jen just laid out with her pictures, what developmentally informed practice actually looks like. Um, to understand how to build teams of teachers across this early childhood and elementary school divide. And then to really understand how policies can and should drive implementation and how implementation can inform policies. So as I said, I think these kinds of professional development are important no matter where we work. Uh, and so we'll give just a few more seconds to get an understanding of where um, PD efforts seem to be residing right now. And as we're uh, closing up this poll, we'll start getting um, Susan Shocklin geared up for her presentation. Susan is an, uh, an actual kindergarten classroom teacher in the state of North Carolina who um, has done quite a bit of work in integrating standards into her own classroom practices. So um, I think it's interesting to see the results from that last poll, that there's been quite a bit of emphasis on what the relationship between standards, curriculum, and assessment should be. But I think it's the lower scoring ones that are also important. 
um, about building teacher teamwork and really understanding the connection between policies and implementation and uh, the, the other one about really using standards to improve instruction. So we're going to hide these poll results and Susan, I'm going to turn presentation um, over to you. Okay, thank you for having me um, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm glad to share one teacher perspective on standards um, in the kindergarten classroom. Um, and I'm also from North Carolina, Walkertown Elementary School there. So next slide, please. I want to begin um, thinking about teachers' perceptions of standards. Uh, when I first started teaching, I came from an early childhood um, background, and I was quite surprised by the amount of practices I saw in kindergarten that appeared somewhat developmentally inappropriate. Um, I was noticing blocks and dramatic play centers were decreasing in size or sometimes altogether. And oftentimes it was in the name of high standards, or teachers said it was because of new standards that they had. Um, so actually in graduate school with, um, at UNCG with Catherine Scott Little, um, I decided to explore this a little bit more by interviewing teachers to gather their perceptions of standards in preschool and kindergarten settings. And so what I found was that while teachers might initially claim that the standards were too high or that they were inappropriate, and that's why maybe they could not use developmentally appropriate practices, especially in the kindergarten setting, um, upon closer look, we found that their lines between standards, um, curriculum, assessments, um, expectations, they were kind of blurry, um, and even old curriculum and habits that they might have had, um, that the teachers really just needed some help in defining the differences between these things. And when they looked closely at the standards themselves, they found that they were not inappropriate in most cases. Um, and in fact, most teachers do appreciate clearly defined and high standards for their students. Um, they keep us focused, they give us that healthy sense of urgency, they help us define our learning targets, and they keep us moving forward. So the problems occur when translating those standards into practice. Um, so once teachers are clear on these differences, I'm sorry if I'll go back one slide, um, on, between these standards, curriculum, and assessments, we sometimes find that it's actually the mandates or the curriculum that is enforced that the idea is that it will meet the standards that truly does cause the frustrations, not the standards themselves, um, especially if the curriculum is linear or segmented, um, has a scripted approach. Sometimes then the teachers find it difficult to meet the needs of all their learners in a developmentally appropriate way, and their focus then becomes on implementing a curriculum rather than understanding the standards themselves and helping children meet them. So instead, teachers appreciate high quality staff development in the standards themselves so that we can truly understand what we want children to know and be able to do. And then time, time needed to discuss those standards with their colleagues and consider what, what they might look like in the context of best practices for young learners. This then in turn helps us explain and us understand what we're doing and why we're doing it um, and rather than just following something prescribed. Okay, next slide, please. So from my perspective, as I've been learning about the Common Core state standards this year, um, I see some shifts. Um, Sue mentioned some shifts earlier as well that I think will actually help teachers merge high standards and best practices for young kids. First, they're more clearly defined and focused, and this focus by grade level allows us to go deeper and to make connections to real life and give children real experiences with those standards. And it will help us avoid that 15-minute increments of unrelated instruction to more lengthy and relevant studies. And there's room and even encouragement for making connections across disciplines and to real world and broad concepts, um, helping us avoid that compartmentalized approach. In kindergarten particularly, I'm excited about the new emphasis on speaking and listening skills um, and this recognition for the need for high quality oral language experiences, um, which can happen in a dramatic play center as you might see here in the picture. So I think that's another support for using developmentally appropriate practices. Um, also, as Sue mentioned, the English language arts um, common core state standards does mention the use of play in the early childhood setting. I see a new emphasis on the process of learning, which helps children be more aware of this process and maybe the strategies they might use, um, and not just the product or isolated pieces of knowledge. 
for teachers if the training opportunities focus on, again, the deep understanding of the standards and opportunities to discuss implementation, then they will have more freedom and more responsibility to examine their practices and their curriculum closely and then make modifications as needed. Next slide, please. So there are some challenges and opportunities um, in kindergarten with the Common Core. Uh, first, weeding out old practices that may no longer be needed. Um, it could just be activities that previously addressed old standards, and it can be challenging for teachers to let those things go, um, but eventually see it as a relief on their time and their ability to go deeper into another facet. Um, with any new standards, teachers need help avoiding the notion of a train um, of information that just keeps move, moving despite the learners um, in the classroom. We've really got to get a hold of a good pacing strategy, but still be able to reach backwards and forwards as needed to meet individual learners. And this will take time as we learn the new standards. It also takes time to find meaningful ways to integrate the standards across and within disciplines. Um, in our state, we also have new science and social studies standards. And so my colleagues and I are kind of looking forward to taking control of our curriculum by finding relevant projects and topics related to those standards that we can then integrate high quality literature, such as the nonfiction uh, literature mentioned in Common Core, and find real math opportunities within those topics. And it just takes time to um, develop and tweak them as we go. In kindergarten and the primary grades, we need to be especially conscious of keeping the whole child in mind. Um, Dean mentioned um, in aligning, looking at the balance among domains, and, and it's a little bit more difficult in primary grades. It's typically easier to do with early learning standards as they are separated by domains, and in the primary grades, we typically have them separated by content areas. So we want to keep those best practices for the whole child in mind, like in this picture using music and movement um, as we consider translating content into practice. Finally, I think it takes time to study and become more familiar with the standards when we consider vertical alignment from a teacher's perspective. Um, you know, as we first start studying the Common Core, we become very focused in our own grade level, and it's easy just to fall back on kind of the horizontal alignment within that grade. Um, and it may take us a while for us to think carefully about what's happening at the grades around us and how we could align our practices to those things as well. Next slide. So I decided to share one um, attempt at utilizing best practices for kindergarten um, to meet standards. And this is um, using ramps and pathways in a kindergarten block center. Um, it's a wonderful addition to any block center. It encourages critical thinking, uh, teamwork, engagement. The kids have great discussions. Um, for me, in my state, it was a great way of addressing the forces and motion strand of our science standards and then integrating um, the Common Core state standards as well. So here on the next slide are some of the Common Core state standards that I saw uh, ramps and pathways addressing um, in my block center. So we could read and we could compare some nonfiction texts about simple machines, which includes the inclined plane, which is what the ramp is. Um, and as children are working together, they definitely express their opinions, and which supports the argument writing found in the Common Core. We would also generate questions together, sort of, again, a shared research proce uh, process about these physical science experiments, such as um, how can you make a marble go up the ramp, or how do different objects behave on the ramp. And we could record our answers together um, as a class or in individual science journals. We would also do some informal research on where would we find inclined planes and why are they used in society and, and, and how are they used. And then there's just lots of great vocabulary that we can expose the kids to as they work um, in the block center with these ramps and pathways. It also addresses the uh, mathematical practice standards one and three. Number one is to make sense and persevere in solving problems, and in kindergarten, I believe that these problems should be formal and informal, so I see this not as necessarily just traditional math problems. Instead, it's just more of this disposition towards perseverance and solving problems in general. Um, and with ramps and pathways, young children are amazing. The way they focus their attention, they take risks, um, try different alternatives, and exhibit self-regulation and persevere. 
um, when you listen in on children working with ramps and pathways, it's obvious they're working on standard three, which is the arguments one, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. When you've established this safe, risk-taking um, climate in your classroom, the children will explain their ideas to others, they'll listen to others' ideas, and they'll modify their thinking and their strategies as they use the ramps. And then one specific kindergarten standard is this describing measurable attributes, and as you work with children in the Ramps and Pathways Center, you can scaffold this vocabulary as they discuss how the heavier marble behaves differently or that they might need a wider tube for this, this particular ramp and, and maybe what shapes they might use when they're building supports for their Ramps and Pathways um, project. So I added some links here that you might like to um, explore later. Um, there are just a few short impromptu videos. They're each under about two minutes. Um, I just took them this year with my camera. Sometimes I'll take videos to show the kids later to continue the discussion about what would make the ramp work. Um, and so they're just two short videos. Um, and I think you will see many examples of the standards just discussed. And they're just fun to watch and listen to the kids as they argue and problem solve together. Um, so overall, I think it's important to know that teachers want high expectations for our children. Um, we need time to process the changes in our new standards um, and time to closely examine that curriculum, assessments, and practices. What might we need to let go of? Uh, what supports and, or does not support the new standards? And time to, to discuss with our colleagues um, these engaging ways that we might be able to help students meet standards across and within, within domains of learning. So thank you for letting me share with you today. Thank you very much, Susan. And apologies um, right now that the video clips could not be shown. Unfortunately, webinar platforms are notoriously bad in, uh, in supporting video clips. So I'm going to go back. So if you want to jot down these web addresses and go look at the video clips once the webinar is over, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, I think I can say I've heard Susan speak before and have seen her videos before that we all wish we could clone Susan and her practices in kindergarten classrooms. She is, I think, truly an example of bringing together the best of early childhood practices in an elementary school context. So I do encourage you to look at uh, the videos. We're now, though, going to launch another poll. Um, we, we already know we don't have a majority of teachers on this website, but I think Susan has given you an idea of what um, well-equipped and well-supported and well-prepared teachers can do around standards. And so the current poll is we're going to ask you to reflect on from um, your experience and your perspective what you think is the biggest barrier that teachers face in this new standards-based climate. Um, whether it's uh, that we have mandated child assessments that are not aligned with standards, whether the professional development systems themselves are one shot and disconnected and therefore not really giving the deep, rich perspective that teachers need. If we simply don't have the classroom materials and resources needed um, to, to meet standards, or if there's a pressure to deliver narrow um, skills-based um, curricula rather than thinking about the whole child and really taking an integrative approach, and then the catch-all category of other. Uh, I think these are probably real barriers that most um, many teachers face, um, but I do think understanding uh, both teachers' barriers, but then getting Sue's, perspective, Sue's kind of perspective about the opportunities that standards present really can inform policymakers at the district and state level in thinking differently about the kinds of supports and systems that they put into place, which is a nice segue into our last presenter, who is Albert Watt from the National Governors Association. And he's going to spend a few minutes reflecting on um, this notion of the policy implications of all of this work. We have standards that exist, but how can policymakers really be helping to support implementation and make standards um, as impactful in a meaningful way that they can? So Albert, I'm going to hide the poll results and move to your slides. Great. Thank you, Christy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Christy said, we wanted just to spend the last few minutes uh, at the end of this webinar to reflect on 
some of the potential levers that state policymakers can use to facilitate the great work that we've heard about um, in North, uh, North Carolina, New York City, and, and I'm sure in other places. So um, the first thing, and uh, maybe the most obvious thing, uh, next slide, Christy, is that um, states can take leadership in um, standards alignment. Um, and as Jean, uh, Jean's presentation said, um, aligning state early learning standards with the common core can promote a more um, consistent and coherent learning experience for children as they transition from the preschool years to kindergarten and early elementary years. Um, and I think we, you know both presentations from New York and North Carolina illustrate how this can really affect and inform classroom practice. Um, but while districts can do this on their own, there are distinct advantages by having states take leadership um, in standards alignment, many of which um, uh, Sue Pimentel mentioned in her presentation. So we want to minimize reinventing the wheel. Uh, we want to promote equity and consistency across communities, as well as promote collaboration across districts. So if you have aligned standards at the state level, it's much easier to accomplish those goals. Um, I think it's also important to be aware, though, that the benefits of aligning early learning standards to the Common Core are um, largely dependent on the extent to which early childhood programs in, in the state are required to use these standards. So in other words, if most preschoolers participate in early childhood programs that don't have to come implement the, learning, the early learning standards, then these kids won't experience the benefits that come from aligning these standards to the Common Core. So what policymakers may need to look at is how um, you know, they can uh, make the early learning standards ha have a greater reach, if you will, across the state. For example, through um, mechanisms like the quality rating and improvement systems or licensing standards and, and that sort of thing. Um, the, um, I should actually go back one slide, if you will. Right. The second point I want to make in the second bullet point is that um, alignment um, can go both ways. Um, states can, uh, may consider aligning also early elementary uh, K3 standards with the early learning standards so that they, they encompass more comprehensive domains of learning and development. Um, so Pennsylvania, for example, has done this across the pre-K to second spectrum, and I believe North Carolina and Washington State are also planning to develop um, this fully aligned first to third grade standards. Um, it gets to this issue that Sue Chaplin um, uh, mentioned about kind of keeping the whole child in mind, not, not just at the pre-K level, but also in early elementary. Um, uh, and, and also, and Sue Pimentel also said, the Common Core developers um, definitely do not intend to convey that all students need uh, to be college and career ready is proficiency in math and reading. So it's really important to keep the multiple domains of development in mind, social and emotional development, physical and motor development, and children's capacity uh, to, to be self-directed learners. Um, and, and I would say that there's also increasing recognition, not just in the, in the early elementary or early child community, but really in in different parts of the education spectrum that these skills are not just important for young children, but students in all grades. So really to promote a more coherent and consistent learning experience for all students, um, policymakers may want to, want to think about how to embrace more, more of these comprehensive standards throughout the K-12 arena. Okay, next slide. So the next thing is about educator training and PD. And um, states can examine the extent to which state policy make, policies and investments in early child education, teacher preparation, and PD um, professional development enhance birth to five teachers' capacity to prepare children for the rigor of the Common Core standards. So um, the New York City and North Carolina speakers have provided some great examples about how their aligned standards inform their pre PD uh, for their pre preschool teachers. So for states that might be looking at their um, birth to eight or pre-K to third um, teaching license, uh, they could look at whether these, whether the requirements in terms of coursework and practicum, et cetera, as well as faculty capacity in, in these uh, schools of education reflect the demands of the Common Core. Um, but of course, that won't reach most early childhood professionals uh, because most of them are not required to have that kind of certification. So to reach the rest of the field, um, policymakers may need to look at the broader early childhood professional development system. So thinking about, for example, are your core, core competencies aligned with core competency for early childhood um, professionals aligned with Common Core, uh, and how can the Common Core standards be incorporated into uh, other kinds of pre-service and in-service requirements that early childhood uh, uh, providers have? Um, and then it's, all, it's, all, it's not also, I mean, sorry, it's not all about the early child teachers, though. Um, uh, and this is the second bullet point. 
on the slide, if we really have fully aligned first to third grade or pre K to third standards that you know embrace comprehensive uh, domains of development, state would need to look at early elementary teachers and leaders as well and how they're prepared. Um, to what extent do state policies and investments in their teacher uh, in their preparation in PD enhance these individuals' capacity to help st uh, students reach both the Common Core standards and standards in other domains of learning and development? Um, some states are using the kindergarten entry assessment as an opportunity to help kindergarten teachers, for example, work on developed domains that typically aren't emphasized in elementary curricula. So, for example, in Connecticut, through um, in the race to the top of the learning challenge proposal, even though they didn't get the grant, they're still moving forward with this plan. They, they've included pro professional development strategies that help kindergarten teachers analyze the kindergarten entry assessment results um, and better support students' social and emotional development. Um, in other states like Illinois and New Jersey, um, they're focusing on K-12 leadership training so that uh, superintendents and principals and other administrators uh, can better support a, a pre-K to third approach to teaching in in their schools. Okay, next slide. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is this notion of sort of creating spaces for alignment. Um, and uh, earlier we had a poll question where um, I think uh, there was a, a, small, uh, the, a small number of people felt like they had professional development that involved teams, you know, teams of early childhood educators and K-12 educators. And I think this is kind of gets at that. So um, states. Um, can support regional or district level strategies that bring early childhood uh, educators and K-12 leaders and practitioners together to share best practices and engage in joint professional development. So for example, for, for a while now, Wisconsin and Maine have collaboration coaches who go to different parts of the state to pro promote collaborations between schools and community-based organizations like early childhood provi providers uh, when implementing the preschool programs. And through support from the Early Learning Challenge, Delaware, Massachusetts, and Washington uh, are creating regional centers or teams that bring early childhood educators and early elementary teachers together, again, for joint PD. Um, and then the second point is that states can also consider developing governance structures that facilitate, and more importantly, institutionalize P3 alignment so that this work is sustained. So this is the second bullet on the slide. Um, uh, for example, states like Maryland and Michigan have brought the major early childhood education programs into um, into the state uh, education agencies. North Carolina and New Jersey have, uh, I'm sorry, North Carolina and New Jersey both have offices of early learning that take a P3 approach to teaching and learning. Um, the governor of Mississippi also made the director of the state's uh, early childhood advisory council part of his policy team. And to the extent that governor set the state's uh, vision for school reform, having an early learning advisor in his or her core team can also promote alignment of policies and strategies broadly. Okay, and the final slide that I have is about um, this issue of resource allocation or reallocation, because I think alignment also requires to look at this issue. Um, in this economy, states are uh, constantly having to revisit their investments across early childhood K-12 and post-secondary education systems to make sure they're spending the limited resources wisely. Um, and if policymakers' goal is to raise the bar through co the Common Core standards uh, uh, and maybe other, and, and other kinds of reform efforts, um, and, and at the same time, if we know, if we understand the research behind the importance of, you know, the early 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 years, the potential impact of high quality programs uh, in early education. And the fact that the achievement gap appears well before kindergarten, if we understand all that and we want to raise the bar starting the kindergarten, then you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a reasonable policy question to, to uh, ask about whether the state is allocating adequate resources within its overall education budget to give kids the best chance to reach higher standards when they enter kindergarten. Um, if states don't have new resources to invest, and that's usually the case these days, um, one one uh, one strategy might be with, you know to look at whether states can find efficiencies uh, within its overall P16 budget um, and apply those cost savings to increase the quality and access to early childhood programs with um, minimal fiscal impact. So, um, so I think it's really important to think about you know for you know how states are investing in things like pre, you know high quality pre-K and full day kindergarten and things like that that really prepare kids to um, 
you know, again, give them the best chance to reach the higher standards that that common core represents. So those are my concluding thoughts, and uh, I, I guess I'll turn it back to you, Christy, for Q&A. Great. Thank you very much, Albert. And thanks to all of our speakers for doing what I think was a um, pretty daunting task, which was to cover classroom to state policy standards issues in one hour. So thank you very much for sticking to your time. Um, I do urge anyone who's listening in, if you have questions, uh, to send those our way. We're going to try to address as many of them as possible. Um, I have a, a couple that have come in that have really been grouped around this notion of um, supporting Common Core implementation in grade um, K-1-2. Um, one particular question to Sophia and Jen. Um, about what's happening in New York City, if there has been any sort of attention to um, uh, changing or expanding the K-2 standards uh, to be more reflective of the multiple domains of learning that you've paid so much close attention to on the pre-K side. So uh, Jen and Sophia, do one of you want to answer that question? Yep, so I'm actually not sure about the actual standards development, but what I can speak to is the instructional expectations for next year, in that the expectation is that people are integrating the Common Core aligned units into science, social studies, all the other areas of um, academics that are present in pre-K to 12. So we're expecting that people are doing literacy aligned Common Core tasks within science units or within social studies units, and the same for math. So we're really promoting this interdisciplinary approach where um, it's helping teachers focus on thematic units across all the grades. Great. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a similar question around uh, grades K2 is more of an assessment issue, I think. Um, and this, Albert, might be something that you want to address because I know you have been thinking about it. And the question comes from a superintendent in New Jersey who's wondering what student learning assessment practices are recommended um, to support Common Core implementation in grades K-2. Is there anything beyond observational data? Right. So one thing to mention is that the PARC consortium, uh, there are two consortia that are uh, developing assessments that uh, kind of grow out of the Common Core or align with the Common Core. Um, but the PARC consortia is working on formative K-2 assessments that are aligned with the Common Core. Now, unfortunately, I think the, the rollout of those tools will be a few years down the road. So um, in the meantime, um, you know, I think one of, one of the questions I would, I would um, think about is, you know, what the purpose is. If it's really for formative to purposes to inform instruction, then, um, you know, I'm not an expert in assessment, but I imagine there are, um, you know, a, a compendium of, of assessment tools that there are out there that, you know, I know there are stuff for pre-K and kindergarten, um, and, uh, and so, so there might be some compendia that might be brought, uh, might, might be helpful in uh, identifying some assessments. If, if um, it's more about, if, it's, if we're thinking about tying any assessment to, you know, teacher evaluation, that sort of thing, then um, that's a tougher question. I, I don't know if there are any assessments out there, and maybe other presenters here um, have, have some thoughts about that, wh whether that might be, uh, it will be appropriate to use those assessments in, in that kind of um, context in terms of teacher evaluation and other maybe high stakes purposes. So, um, yeah, so I think I would stop there and let others chime in if they have any other thoughts. Yes, yeah, Sue or Sue, I wonder if either, you, either of you have thoughts on this um, question of assessment practices in grades K through 2. And while you're um, gathering your thoughts, I will also note that a future webinar hosted by the Pre-K through 3rd grade National Work Group is going to look at child assessment issues. Um, and so at that time, we will be sure that our presenters address these notions of what good and appropriate and meaningful child assessment looks like across the full pre-K through third grade span. So that is something to look forward to over the next month. So uh, Sue or I, Sue, I don't know okay. if you have something you want to weigh in on. So this is, um, yeah, this is Sue and Helen. Um, just to sort of uh, maybe underscore what Albert said is, um, I do know that they're, they're just beginning to look into this, uh, the, the K-2 arena now. Um, I do think that the only thing I can say 
um, and maybe this this, uh, the, this this other group is going to be informing what's going on in park is I do know they're looking for ways um, to look at more than just observational data um, uh, and of course that becomes um, tough when you're talking about the little ones, you know, but there's a, there's a sense that they may be able to be able to use technology in ways we haven't used it before. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, talking to things, um, uh, you know, other, other kinds of ways that, that they can um, uh, show what they're learning. So I think we're just at the beginning stages of this. Um, and uh, so stay tuned. So hearing from others about what, what makes good sense and what, what feels appropriate, what will give good information for teachers. And I think there is a strong desire to go um, beyond just observational data in a way that, so that, in a way that it can be aggregated and, and the teachers can, um, uh, um, can learn from it in addition to observational data. Great. And Albert, uh, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, just one more thought. Um, I, so one, I know of one state, North Carolina, that is planning to develop um, uh, K2, uh, K3 assessments, formative assessments um, that are aligned to the, the Common Core as well as um, uh, I mentioned that they're building uh, broader uh, comprehensive learning standards across the first to third grade. So they're also uh, building, uh, developing assessments that align to those broader standards as well. So um, the big, at the beginning stages, uh, if this person who asked the question is interested in learning more about that effort and getting connected to folks in North Carolina, I'd be happy to um, uh, help, help him or her do that if, if they email me. Terrific. Thanks very much. Um, so presenters, I have two big questions. I'm going to um, say both of them out loud right now so you can gather your thoughts and then I'll give you um, all a chance to respond. Um, the first is around the uh, notion of um, dual language learners and wondering to um, what extent uh, the Common Core and your uh, individual efforts are really paying attention to using standards um, to, to provide what the um, questioner is asking to create cognitively demanding learning experiences in their first language as they acquire and learn English. So the first question is around our dual language learners. And the second question that I'll pose for you all to think about is how can community-based providers, so this would be community-based child care, um, family child care, and then other informal institutions like museums be engaged in the standards work. So um, let's go back to the DLL question and see if anyone wants to weigh in on that. This is Sue Pimentel, and um, uh, this may not be a direct answer, but there's something called the Understanding Language Project that is being run by Kenji Hakuda out of Stanford. And um, in the domains of math, um, uh, English language arts, and science, um, they are working on um, a variety of tools for teachers uh, to teach um, English language learners. Um, uh, so I know in the ELA group that we're working in that we've got, we've got a unit um, that teachers are actually going to practice with um, this summer, give us feedback about what's working and what's not. Um, that doesn't go directly to um, uh, uh, learning in one's uh, first language, but there are but there are elements of of using a student's first language um, skills and and all the benefits that that brings um, and and applying that to to their learning so that it's not um, uh, just uh, you know use you know use your English. It's also one of the the, the big issues um, that is being promoted by this um, project is that students not be siloed um, off until they, you know, you kind of pound English into them and then you think that they're at a certain level and only then will you let them come in and learn the content of math, the content of science, the content in, in English language arts. And there's a sense of, of helping them along the way but not keeping them from that content. The other piece that I'll just let you know, and this is under the auspices of CCSSO, um, we're in the process of, of putting together um, an um, English language um, Provisioning Development Framework, which is to help states um, and districts um, put together um, a good ELP or ELD standards that are um, a, a bridge and support the implementation of the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. And there are drafts of that that will soon be out um, and, and um, uh, for use in states and districts, which really, tr which really try to 
um, unpackaged will, the language demands that are included in the Common Core State Standards for math and ELA, and also for the Next Generation Science Standards. And those, those are really, so there's a sense of, 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 a, of a great opportunity and a lot of challenge. Great. Uh, so could you please repeat those names, the names of the organizations associated with the Understanding Language Project? Yeah, it's Understanding Language Project, and it's Kenji Hakuda, um, who's out of Stanford. Um, and it's uh, um, supported by Gates and by Carnegie. It's a two-year project, and it has many moving parts. Um, I think you can probably, um, I think there's a website up now, um, and uh, this, there are teams of people working in math and in science and in English language arts. And then the other one is under the auspices of CCSSO in terms of developing a, a guidance document, a framework document, if you will, for states and districts that are developing or adapting their English language proficiency um, or English language development standards. Christy, can I add Great. a few things to that topic? Yes, please. So another group that people might be um, uh, might want to look into is uh, the, uh, their, uh, the acronym is WIDA. Um, it stands for World Class Instructional Design and Assessment. And they've been doing some work on um, English language learners on the K-12 K um, arena. And now they are developing, what I understand is that they're developing early learning development um, stand, early language development standards for dual language learners uh, for kids at between three and five years of age. Uh, so um, it's another consortium of states uh, that, uh, you know, they're working with states to, to do that. I think they're at the beginning stages, um, but uh, um, I might, I, I probably have, I should have some content information if people are interested. Um, and then I think uh, another place to look at is, is that there are a couple of states that I think have um, interesting, you know, uh, early learning standards in, in, this, in this regard, um, Alaska particularly have early, their early learning standards, early learning standards include um, uh, uh, standards about first language development. Um, so you, people might, if you're interested in how states are doing that, that might be one place to look. And then I think in, in California, their learning standards um, incorporate, uh, basically they have a sort of these in, English language development standards that are sort of different and separate from uh, sort of the typical uh, English Develop or language and literacy development because to, to reflect the, the notion that the dual language learners, their learning traje trajectory in English are, is different from native English speakers. So, so they've sort of developed a whole set of standards that are for that population. Um, so California standards might be another way, another place to look. Great, thanks. So with just about five minutes left, I wonder if we can uh, turn to the question about how to better engage uh, the community-based partners, whether it be on the preschool side, the community-based child care, family child cares, or the broader community partners, such as uh, museums, uh, in, in supporting implementation of standards. Does anyone have thoughts on that? Um, I heard Jennifer from New Jersey mention um, some sounded like some shared staff development between preschool teachers and K kindergarten teachers or maybe K3 teachers um, and I've been doing a little bit of that in my district as well and I, I find it really powerful when you can bring in those community-based teachers with the public school teachers and just start the conversation about the Common Core, about standards and about practices. Yeah, this is uh, Jen from New York. I was just about to chime in. Thank you. So we've done two things that might be interesting for people. One, we do do the same professional development sessions for our community-based organization pre-K teachers and our public school teachers. So they're both getting the same content, the same expectations around the Common Core. They think that's really powerful. Um, we've done a couple things to bring together the leaders from our community-based organizations with the leaders from our public schools. So even in just the past month, um, first we held a kindergarten transition summit in collaboration with the Administration for Children and Families who oversees the Head Start. And we brought together leaders from elementary schools, from charter schools, and from community-based organizations to talk about the transition to kindergarten. And so by default, within those conversations came about conversations about standards and what we're doing to prepare children for schools, how schools are preparing for children, etc. And the other thing that we did was have um, 
About 120 of our community-based organization directors come to the Chancellor's Principal Conference, which was held two weeks ago. And so there they heard a lot of messaging around this P-12 implementation of the Common Core in New York City, the, the issues that we're all grappling with as we're implementing it. I think that was a really powerful message, again, for people to understand. Here we are, leaders at the front end of this P-12 continuum. And here we are all grappling with and all trying to raise expectations in the same way. Great. And this is Christy Cowers with the Pre-K through Third Grade National Work Group. And I would just weigh in that I think this partnering with community-based organizations is crucial. And one of the, and this is going to answer another question that's come in about this, um, the need to create spaces for these partners to come together and do the alignment work. I think those who have the position and the resources to offer professional development, which does include states, it does include school districts, it does include many schools and many community-based organizations, need to think more comprehensively about who needs that kind of professional development. And if you are doing some sort of um, PD around standards, inviting, as has just been described, that happens in New York, not just the community-based preschool teachers, but do bring in um, the local libraries, do bring in after-school programs, do bring in summer camp providers, to give them some understanding of the kinds of standards that uh, are being used in the school system, and giving them strategies for how they can be integrating those um, into their own work. Um, I think in many instances, it's just needing to think a little more broadly and creatively about who to include in our professional development efforts um, because all of these partners want to be uh, participating and helping to close achievement gaps. Um, I'm wondering if there's any final comments for um, from presenters that you want to weigh in on. We're down to our last three minutes, so I'll put up our last polling question and close the webinar unless anyone has other comments they want to make. Anyone? All right, good. So our last poll is uh, asking you to reflect on um, whether or not the last hour and a half has really helped you think differently um, about standards, the role of standards, and the uh, linkages between standards themselves and implementation in classrooms. Um, while uh, you are voting, um, you should be able to see, at least partially on your screen, that the next webinar to be hosted by the Pre-K through Third Grade National Work Group is going to be in September. We're taking the summer months off because we know that many of you do that. Um, so the next webinar is Wednesday, September 19th. On that, uh, in that webinar, we're going to be focusing on curricula, not just sort of what um, curricula uh, what elements of curricula matter, but how curricula should be selected um, and who should be involved in implementing. Um, we also want to uh, thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for underwriting the technology costs behind this webinar. Um, in general, we do this as a volunteer basis, but the technology itself required resources and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have made that possible. And then as has been noted several times throughout the webinar, there will be both a recording that includes the actual presentation and voices of the webinar, as well as a copy of the slide deck itself posted at the website uh, noted below, wwwprek through third grade national workgroup.org. So we thank you all very much for your participation. Hope you learned something. I always learn something every time I listen in. And we look forward to seeing you all in September. And thanks very much to all of our speakers. Thanks, Christy.